now that we've gotten through the commander stuff, I can actually talk about more of Outlaws at Thunder Junction, and it's just in time because the pre-release events actually take place this weekend at the time of recording, but I want to talk about the big score, which is the set within a set of a set that has like five different sets within it. If that's hard to follow, I did make a video talking about collecting Outlaws of Thunder Junction. You guys can check that out. It does break down a little bit more um, specifically what each subcategory is. But I want to talk about the big score because it is a unique approach to set design. So let's get into it. And we're going to take a look today at the top 10 cards in the big score expansion. Alright everybody, thanks so much for being here. As always, I really do appreciate you, and I don't just say that, I really do mean it. Uh, if you do enjoy the video, please hit the like button and subscribe, and then click that bell icon if you want to be notified when new videos are posted. But yes, the big score is a subset of Outlaws at Thunder Junction, and it isn't like a Strixhaven Mythical Archive set. We actually have one of those in this set. It's the OTP set code, which is the poster stuff, and I'll probably talk about that in another video. But I want to talk about the big score because most of the cards in big score are new, and all of the cards in big score are standard legal. So it was originally supposed to be its own set similar to March of the Machine Aftermath. They ended up deciding to you know, put it into this set because of how bad it was, uh, how bad Aftermath was. And so now it will be essentially in the list slot, although there'll be a higher chance of pulling cards from that slot. And everything here is going to be Mythic Rare. So that's a little bit of added context on the big score. But let's get into it, starting with number 10. Number 10 is Loot, the key to everything. Now, I have to say... I think this card is getting some hate from Magic players, and I don't really know why. It's kind of adorable. I think you see people either love it or hate it. Um, the art's a little weird. His mouth's got some weirdness going on with it. But Loot is uh, already uh, stirring up quite a bit of controversy, uh, and he's already being used as a sort of uh, mascot, if you will. There is actually um, apparently an Ultra Pro line of merch coming out that's going to have Loot, and I think we actually are getting like a Loot plush as well. Um, a little bit later down the line, but the card itself is interesting. It's a uh, green, blue, red, legendary creature, Beast Noble with Ward 1, and it says at the beginning of your upkeep, exile the top X cards of your library, where X is the number of card types among other non-land permanents you control. You may play those cards this turn. Now, I do like the art. I think it's adorable, and I don't think the card's terrible or anything, but it's relatively weak, in my opinion, compared to other cards in this subset. You know, being able to basically impulse draw and play those cards that turn is fine, but it's also like, you really, especially in standard, I just don't really see where it's going to be game breaking, if you will. Um, you could obviously build around it as a commander, and with a lot of the new cards we've seen that have to deal with casting stuff that you don't own or casting stuff that's not from your hand, you might be able to make some things work there playing things out of exile. But as a just sort of a standalone card, it's. It's okay. Um, I think a, a lot of the popularity is, of course, you know, going to be in the design. And yeah, it's kind of adorable and it's story relevant because they find the vault and he's the main treasure in it. So, you know, whatever for whatever that's worth, I um, think it's a cool card, but not exactly blowing me away. Still, I think it's significant and it's probably going to be a card that might have a bit of value, at least for some of its more premium versions. On to number nine. At number nine, we've got Grand Abolisher. This card is not new, actually, but it is getting reprinted and will be standard legal. Um, and this card is really strong if you're unfamiliar with it. It was recently reprinted in Commander Masters, and prior to that reprint was a pretty pricey card. Uh, but it is too white and is a creature human cleric. During your turn, your opponent can't cast spells or activate abilities of artifacts, creatures, or enchantments. Obviously, good for seeing it get a reprint. It went down to like 10 bucks after its last reprint, so value-wise for other formats, it's definitely not a bad uh, thing to see more accessible copies. Copies. I'm actually really interested in how this is going to play in standard because it's a pretty powerful card. I do think it's going to have a chance to uh, make an impact in certain decks. At the very least, I gotta imagine it's going to be a very good sideboard card, but it's a strong card and it's been a while since it's been legal in any type of standard format. So I'm looking forward to seeing what actually comes of it. But yes, Grand Abolisher at number nine. I do think this card is going to be, you know, desired not just for the standard format, but just in general. Um, and especially because there are some premium versions of it here, uh, people might be looking to get their hands on it. 
Next up at number 8, we've got Collector's Cage. This is one and a white artifact with Hideaway 5. So when it enters the battlefield, you look at the top 5 cards of your deck, pick one, exile it face down, and that's how the Hideaway works. There's a land cycle that has Hideaway, among other cards. Um, so you pay one and tap, put a plus one, plus one counter on a target creature you control. Then if you control three or more creatures with different powers, you may play the exiled card without paying its mana cost. All in all, I think this is a really solid card. At the very worst, once you have it on the field, for one mana each turn, you can just start to generate plus one plus one counters on your creatures. That alone is pretty damn strong. And the hideaway, I mean, it's really not hard to resolve as something with three or more creatures with different powers. You have zero, one, two. You can probably make this live by turn two or three in certain decks, especially if you kind of build around it that way. Um, and I think that's probably something that people will try to do. I do think it's a really, really good card. And the fact that it's low cost is going to be its biggest point of appeal i know for commander it's absolutely going to have applications because just Ozgear is a deck i think of that i could that could really make use of something like this and you can use it in combos with you know the tutors put something on top of the deck and then get it out later just overall a pretty good card Number seven, Transmutation Font. This card is five mana artifact. Tap, create your choice of a blood token, a clue token, or a food token. You can pay three and sacrifice three different artifact tokens with different names. Search your library for an artifact card, put it onto the battlefield, then shuffle. Activate only as a sorcery. Now, the best thing about this card, of course, is its synergy with Academy Manufacturer. Of course, Academy Manufacturer, if you're not familiar, I'll pop them up on the screen for a moment. But if you would make a food token, a treasure token, or a clue token, you instead make one of each. So obviously, just making one singular token will immediately fulfill the requirements to be able to use this card. And it does not have to sacrifice itself, meaning you can continue to use this on future turns. And with just those two cards, you can basically pull whatever artifacts you need out of the deck. I think this is actually a way you can cheat, like, Blightsteel Colossus out, because he doesn't have to worry about it. You can't mill him to the grave, because he'll get shuffled back in, but... That's just a one combo of many uh, that you could do with this, bringing out creatures. I think it's a really good card. It, it, it's hindered a little bit by its cost, but there are so many cards that can reduce the cost of artifacts. And it's not even a legendary artifact. So, you know, I mentioned Ozgear as a possibility. You make a couple copies of it. You're pulling all sorts of things from the deck and really kind of getting things going. Um, just overall a really solid card, in my opinion. Number six, Lost Jeet. This is a one-drop legendary artifact equipment. Whenever a equipped creature deals combat damage, put a charge counter on Lost Jeet. Remove a charge counter from it, then choose one. Untap target land. Target creature can't block this turn. Or put a plus one plus one counter on equipped creature. And then, of course, it does have equip one. Um, obviously, a very, very cool card, and it's you know, uh, there are other, there's another Jeet card, and of course, at the time I'm recording this, I can't remember the exact name of it, but I'll put it up on the screen so you guys know what I'm talking about. Um, there's a lot of things you can do here, and being able to, even with things like proliferate and stuff, um, being able to shut off things from blocking, putting extra counters on stuff, it's really easy to stack it up, and, and the untapping target lands is certainly not going to be bad either. I think its strongest element is definitely going to be, like, shutting off blocking. If you have ways to accumulate counters and you want to make sure your stuff gets through, um, it's definitely going to be a good way to do it. But overall, I think it's a really, really solid card, and I am excited to see what type of application it will have. Pest Control at number 5. This card is really strong, and when I first saw it, for some reason, I thought it was a reprint, and it's not. It doesn't exist anywhere else. Um, it is one white and one black sorcery. Destroy all non-land permanents with mana value 1 or less, and then it has Cycling 2. So, right off the bat, I mean, this card's insane application with, uh, with you know, against token-based decks, right? You know, goblin tokens, squirrel tokens, all kinds of things. I think that's going to be the most you know, impact this is going to have against decks that just make a lot of tokens. Obviously, tokens don't have mana costs, and you can wipe the board, and if you're not playing tokens, your stuff's pretty much fine. Um, you can also pop stuff like Soul Ring with this, which is, is certainly not a bad um, additional thing to have, uh, but this card across the board is just really, really strong, and it's, it's so cheap to cast while also having the cycling added to it. Just overall, a really, really good card. I don't know too much about the standard format anymore, uh, so I don't know that there's a lot of, like, low mana cost stuff this is going to pop, but in Commander and in other formats where maybe tokens are a lot more prevalent, you're going to absolutely want to use this. And for the record, it does also get rid of treasure, food tokens, etc. So if you are playing against a deck that can spam that stuff, this can get rid of those too, which just makes it an extremely, really useful card for pretty much any deck that can play it, um, you know, depending on what type of decks you're commonly facing. 
Number four, Molten Duplication. This is one in a red sorcery. Create a token that's a copy of target artifact or creature you control, except it's an artifact in addition to its other types, and it gains haste until end of turn. Sacrifice it at the beginning of the next end step. So the reason I put this so high on the list is I think the fact that it's only cost two mana to play opens up the ability to do so many crazy things with it. Being able to make a copy of any creature, obviously it is still a... Um, it is still legendary. It doesn't bypass the legendary clause. You know, that would be kind of busted if it did for such a low cost. Um, but just, it's a generally strong card that can do a lot. And there are so many different things. I mean, being able to make copies of your artifacts, we just talked about some of the new artifacts in the set that are going to be really strong. So this card fits perfectly in with those. But there are also tons of other non-legendary artifacts you can make copies of. And you, I mean... The creature pool is massive of things that will be able to benefit from this, especially with haste. Just overall, I think Molten Duplication is going to be fit quite nicely into a lot of different strategies. Number three, Simulacrum Synthesizer. Say that three times fast. Two and a blue artifact. When it enters the battlefield, scry two. Whenever another artifact of mana value three or greater enters the battlefield under your control, create a zero zero colorless construct artifact creature token with this creature gets plus one plus one for each creature you control. Now, on the surface, the cards is, it obviously seems good. It doesn't seem, it's not broken, um, but I think it's extremely good, especially with the blue artifact decks, the Urza decks, um, being able to generate these tokens it's not a hard ones per turn so you're able to if you can start putting things out pretty consistently you're making an army of tokens that are just going to be really buffed up really quick and it's a pretty low investment the scrying on top of that is certainly really good and not something to overlook but in general this this engine to be able to generate these these artifact tokens and, and three or greater you know if you're playing cards like foundry inspector or other things that can lower the cost of your artifacts before you put them into play they still have a mana value three or greater so you can abuse this even further by being able to put those things out i just think this card is really good and is absolutely while, while it is a bit more narrow in its application it is certainly going to be impactful in the decks that can make use of it Number two, Sword of Wealth and Power. This is, the artwork on this is crazy, and there are a few different variant arts of this, as well as what I think is like a textured foil or a raised foil. I don't know, there's so many different foil styles in this set, I didn't really bother diving into that too much, because you'll find what you'll find elsewhere. I want to talk about the cards and the set construction versus the different foil stylings, but I'm sure they'll be all over the place. Either way, even the standard art of it looks really, really nice. It is a three-drop sword, of course, artifact equipment. Equipped creature gets plus two, plus two, and has protection from instants and swords. Sorceries. Whenever a creature deals combat damage to a player, create a treasure token. Then, when you cast an instant or sorcery next this turn, copy that spell. You may choose new targets for the copy. So, this is absolutely insane. It is one of the better swords right off the bat. Protection of instants and sorceries all, uh, just in, across the board is just incredibly good, right? Um, it can't take damage from it, it can't be targeted by them, so like that's good on its own. But being able to make tokens and then automatically copy your own instance or sorceries, there are so many different ways to just make this work. It's spell slinger strategies. Generically speaking, I don't really see why most decks wouldn't want to include this if you have the space for it, because they're really it is just that solid and does so many different things and it's not like deck, every deck plays instants and sorceries so it's like having that protection built in and also being able to generate resources the card will pay for itself very very quickly um and anytime we get a new sword into the cycle it's just like it's 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 always going to be in contention for one of the best cards in the set at least so far i mean they haven't let us down yet with a sword i think and some are a little weaker than others sure but if it falls into that main line sword um you know it's they're, they're all pretty damn good, and this one is no exception. And finally, number one is Lotus Ring. And this, of course, any anytime you get a Lotus-inspired card, it's either going to be dog shit or it's going to be busted. I feel like there's no in-between. And this one, it definitely leans more towards the latter. Um, it is a three-drop artifact with indestructible. Equip creature gets plus three, plus three, and has vigilance. And sacrifice this creature, add three mana of any one color. Of course, it does have equip three. So it turns your creature into a black Lotus that also has vigilance and gets plus three, plus three. And the ring itself is indestructible, which is some sort of really nice to be able to use it on future turns there are going to be so many combos with this that can go infinite using just a few number of cards and you've already uh, I've, we've seen some youtubers make videos talking about it already i would recommend maybe checking those out if you're interested in the specific combos and what it can do but i i just this card it has so much going for it and I, I like the flavor of you know new lotus cards in general like typically when a new lotus card comes out it's exciting most of the time um this one just i mean it it 
after it gets out and with the amount of decks that can really make use of like reducing equipment costs making copies of artifacts doing all sorts of things of that nature i in my personal opinion i think this is the best card out of the new expansion and i think it's going to end up long term being one of the more valuable ones it's really hard to put much stock in pre-sale prices because of how frequently they change but lotus ring is going to be at the top and is certainly one of the best selling pre-order cards currently um on the market so it's definitely one to look at what do you guys think? Did I leave cards out of the big score that you think should be included? Do you disagree with the order of some of these things? Let me know in the comment section down below. I'd like to know your thoughts, and I'll catch you guys in the next video. Peace.